Today I've got a couple of nice algebra competition style math problems to show you guys. So the first one has to do with a system of nonlinear equations. So we want to find all real numbers x and y satisfying this system of two equations and two unknowns. So we've got y equals 2 minus x cubed and x equals 2 minus y cubed. So there's some nice symmetry to that. In fact, the symmetry is so nice that there's probably something special about this function 2 minus something cubed. So keeping that in mind, let's go ahead and define that as some sort of function. So let's define g of, and I'm going to use the variable z here, although you could really use anything as a variable. I just want to use something that is not x and y because those are like playing the role in this equation over here. So we've got g of z equals 2 minus z cubed. So next up what we want to do is suppose that we've got x and y satisfying our system of equations. So we'll just say x and y satisfy our equations. Furthermore, we can put them in some sort of order and that's because we've got symmetry between x and y here. And so maybe we should put them in non decreasing order. So maybe we'll say without loss of generality, let's assume that x is less than or equal to y. The next thing that I want to notice is that our function g is a decreasing function. So we could check that a bunch of different ways. You could take maybe the first derivative and see that it's always negative, or you could do it with some inequalities. But needless to say, g is a decreasing function. But the fact that g is a decreasing function tells us that g of x is less than or equal to x. But then the fact that x and y satisfy our equations mean that g of x is equal to 2 minus x cubed, which is equal to y. Again, because that's this first equation right here. OK, so now what I want to do is put this inequality together with this string of inequalities and see what we get. So we'll start out here on the left y. And we see that y is less than or equal to x traveling through this path. But then our assumption here is that x is less than or equal to y. So in the end, we've pinned y around x. So that means that x has to be equal to y. And that's actually really good news because that'll be a huge simplifying fact here. We can plug y equals x into maybe this equation right here, and then we've got a cubic polynomial to solve. So in other words, what we need to solve is x equals 2 minus x cubed. Let's maybe see how we could do that. That's the same thing as x cubed plus x minus 2 equals 0. So now we need to find the roots of that cubic polynomial. Now, using the rational root theorem, we can get a guess for a rational root. And so the possible rational roots are plus minus 2 and plus minus 1. And then you can check really quickly that the only rational root is plus 1. So we can keep this plus 1 as our rational root. And so you could just check by plugging those other three values into our polynomial and see that this equation is not satisfied. OK, so but that tells us that x cubed plus x minus 2 factors like x minus 1 times a quadratic polynomial. There's a couple of ways to do this. You could do polynomial long division or synthetic division or something like that. But I would say the best thing here is just to guess and check until we get the values. We know that our coefficient on x squared must be 1 because the final coefficient on x cubed is 1. We know our constant term must be plus 2. And so that means all we need to figure out is the coefficient of the x term. So let's see maybe what that would be. So notice that the coefficient of the x term here is positive 1. And then here the coefficient of the x term will be 2x and then whatever we have right here. That means we need a plus x right here. So let's just go ahead and check that that works. 
We have x times x is x squared minus x squared. The coefficient of x squared is zero, and then everything else works out as well. Now you can check that the discriminant of this does not allow for any real roots. So I'll just note that like that, there are no real roots in that quadratic polynomial, which tells us that the only real root is x equals one, but then that corresponds to x equals one, y equals one as a solution to our original equation. Okay, so let's maybe get rid of this and we'll look at our second question. So we just got done finding a solution to the following system of nonlinear equations. Now we wanna look at this second question. So we've got a cubic polynomial and we want to answer when does this have integer roots? And what we're asking is what natural numbers A and B, by natural numbers I mean positive integers, satisfy the condition that x cubed minus 17x squared plus ax minus b squared equals zero has three integer roots. Okay, so now looking at this, you'll see after playing around with it a little bit that it would be much easier if we could start with the fact that we have to have positive integer roots. In other words, it's impossible for this to have negative integer roots. So let's maybe prove that as a lemma first. So we'll say lemma if c, which is an integer, is a root, then c is strictly bigger than zero. Okay, so let's maybe see how this proof goes. We'll do this by way of contradiction. So in other words, let's suppose that C is less than or equal to zero and a root of this polynomial equation. But then the fact that C is less than or equal to zero tells us, well, first off that C cubed is less than or equal to zero. If you cube a negative number, you get a negative number. And that tells us that a times c is also less than or equal to zero because we're taking a to be a natural number here. Okay, but putting those two things together, we see that c cubed plus ac is less than or equal to zero. But now what we could do is just add on the rest of this to create this polynomial over here. So that tells us that c cubed minus 17c squared plus a times c minus b squared is less than or equal to negative b squared. Again, because all of these things are less than or equal to zero. Okay, but then b squared is a natural number, which means minus b squared is strictly less than zero. But then if it's strictly less than zero, then that means that this thing right here can never be equal to zero, which brings us our contradiction that this was a root in the first place. Okay, let's maybe erase the proof of this lemma and then we'll move on to the next part. So we just got done proving that the roots of our polynomial have to be positive integers, in other words, natural numbers. That means we can take this polynomial and factor it as x minus l, x minus m, and x minus n, where l, m, and n are natural numbers. Next up, I wanna multiply out this right-hand side and then equate some coefficients. So notice we'll get x cubed minus l plus m plus n times x squared. So that's the quadratic term. And then we'll have plus lm plus ln plus mn times x. And then finally minus lmn like that. Okay, but now equating some coefficients, that tells us that L plus M plus N equals 17. That's from setting this negative 17 equal to this negative the sum. And then we see that A will be equal to this combination of L, M, and N. So let's write that down. L, M plus L, N plus M, N <coughs> equals A. And then finally, minus b squared must be equal to minus lmn. So that means that l times m times n has to be equal to b squared. Okay, so what we're looking for are combinations of three numbers that add to 17 
whose product is a perfect square. And just like we did in the last problem, we can assume some sort of ordering on L, M, and N. We'll assume that L is less than or equal to M, which is less than or equal to N. So that means we've got these triples, L, M, and N must have the following shape. So we've got, it can be 10 plus five plus two. So in other words, 10 comma five comma two. So notice the product of those three is 100, which is a perfect square. Notice that we can't take anything larger than 10. Notice we could take L to be equal to 11, but then we could never pair that with another 11 to make something that's a multiple of 11 squared. And then furthermore, L equals 12, 13, 14, and 15 will also not work. Okay, now we'll do move down the line and see if it's possible for L to equal nine. So notice nine is equal to three squared. So that means the M and the N part must also have the product of a perfect square. And it turns out that the only way to get that is with four and four. So notice nine plus four plus four is gonna be equal to 25, that's a perfect square. Then we can keep moving down. So if we let L equal to eight, then that means that m plus n must be equal to nine. And we'll see that the only way to get that, preserving this perfect squareness, will be eight and one. And then you can play the game going further and see that you don't get any other possibilities. Okay, so let's see what this says about the values of a and b. And we can do that by looking at this equation right here and this equation right here. Okay, so here we see L times M is 50, L times N is 20, so that's gonna be 70 plus 10, so that means we've got A equals 80, and then here we have B equals 10, because that's gonna be 100, which is 10 squared. Now moving on here, let's see what we have. We have nine times four, nine times four, so that's gonna be 36 plus 36 is 72 plus 16, so I believe that's 88. So here we get that A is equal to 88, and then B will be equal to the square root of the product of those things. So that's the square root of nine times 16, which will be the same thing as three times four is 12. Okay, now we've got one more, this 881, and then that'll give us eight times eight is 64, and then eight times one and eight times one, so we've got 64 plus 16, so that gives us 80 again. So here A is equal to 80, but now B is equal to something else. Notice that B is the square root of eight times eight times one. So that makes B equal to eight. So those are the three only choices for A and B that satisfy this condition over here. And that's a good place to stop.